Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning uh, from Australia, that is. It's uh, 10 a.m. Uh, local time here in Australia. And thank you so much for joining us for this plenary session for the Connected Learning Summit 2023. Uh, we have a really exciting plenary for you today focused on AI, algorithms, and connected learning. My name is uh, Michael Dejuani. I'm a professor of digital media and learning at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. And uh, I want to just uh, start today by acknowledging uh, that I'm meeting you from um, unceded lands uh, and acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Australia are the First Nations owners of, of the lands um, where we're meeting. And uh, my university, Queensland University of Technology, um, is on the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara. And uh, we, I just want to pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So today we um, have, I, I want to just um, also begin by uh, talking about um, the hosts of the Connected Learning Summit. And you can see those on the screen there. Um, I won't read through all of these, but uh, a number of organizations come together to, to host the Connected Learning Summit. Uh, and there's been quite a large committee of people who have also worked hard to um, bring this event together. Uh, and so I just want to also um, acknowledge all of the people on the screen there as, as the organizers and recognizing too that uh, this is an event that happens across a few different time zones. And so different groups of people have been working together to pull together different parts of the program. Uh, and I would like to very much acknowledge um, the, the staff who've been working uh, away in the background to also um, take care of all of the logistical aspects of, of bringing this event together. And again, you can see their names on the screen. Um, we're working on the, the Hoover platform. And uh, so if you need any assistance with the Hoover platform, uh, you can click on the community um, tab on the left-hand side there. And then you'll um, see that you can ask organizers anything. So if you uh, need to ask someone a question, please just go ahead and uh, go through that process and you should receive some assistance quite quickly. Um, and the hashtag, of course, for the event, uh, hashtag CL Summit 2023. So our, um, our opening plenary today, uh, AI and Algorithms for Connected Learning, is, is featuring Louisa Bartolo, Carly Beckman, and Martin Delat, um, and I'm moderating. And um, so we're going to hear, first of all, from each of our three presenters, and then uh, we'll move into some, some questions from me as moderator. And then for the last 15 minutes or so, we'll open up to broader Q&A. So please um, be ready with your questions for that part of the session. Uh, so I'll just uh, introduce, I'll just go through some bios for each of our speakers first, and then I'll hand over, first of all, to, to Carly to, um, to talk for five minutes. But Carly Beckman is a senior lecturer in digital technologies for learning in the School of Education at the University of Wollongong. Carly's research investigates children, young people, and adult learners' technology practice through a sociological framing uh, to critically engage with issues of digital inequality, digital literacy, um, and toward the development of a theoretically informed understanding of the place of technology in our lives. Uh, Martin Delat is Professor of Augmented and Networked Learning and Co-Director at the Centre for Change and Complexity in Learning. Um, at the University of South Australia. His research focuses on augmented learning and value creation in social networks. He uses uh, a practice-based research methodologies to study the impact technology, AI, learning analytics, and social design has on the way social, uh, has on the way social networks and communities work, learn, and innovate. And uh, Louisa Bartalo is currently finishing her PhD at the Digital Media Research Center at Queensland University of Technology and is um, a student member of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision-Making and Society. And she specialises in the policy surrounding digital platforms, algorithmic recommendation systems, 
um, and was one of the experts who uh, fed into the discussions for the Australian eSafety Commissioner's recent position statement on algorithm, al algorithmic recommendation. And uh, prior to her PhD, um, Louisa worked at a major UK children's charity, the Diana Award, developing um, a, and delivering a youth-directed educational toolkit on tackling online hate speech. And uh, Louisa is joining us from Malta actually today and uh, where it's 1 a.m. So particular shout out to Louisa for staying up um, in the middle of the night to, to be with us. So um, I'm going to hand over now to, to Carly and um, we'll hear from each of our speakers just for five minutes or so before we move into that question and answer. Uh, so over to you, Carly. Thanks, Michael. Okay, so my take on the topic of AI and algorithms for learning um, today is with a particular focus on schools. So I have a background as a primary school teacher um, and a lot of my research focuses on children and young people and the way that they use digital technologies um, through their learning and, and other contexts. So while AI has been used in education for over a decade, the hype around generative AI, specifically ChatGPT, has really captivated and in many ways caused quite a lot of panic within education institutions. And this has led to the ban of generative AI in schools in many places, um, and particularly in Australia where I am. Um, this hype has certainly calmed to some degree um, after 12 months, but and education systems are being encouraged to now embrace AI and largely without a roadmap. And the, they're being encouraged to embrace it for fear of being left behind. Within Australia, we've recently heard our federal education minister give his support for our version of a roadmap, which is an Australian framework for generative AI in schools. Um, and this framework, in my opinion, outlines some aspirational principles for the use of generative AI, but critically lacks insight into how these might be achieved and nor does it adequately provide measures to support teachers to be able to implement AI in schools to support student learning. So I think importantly, before we're ready for effective use of AI for learning in schools, I believe there are two important steps that need to be prioritised. And that's not to say that these aren't happening in schools, um, but I think we need more time and attention for these. So firstly, I think we really need to carefully consider where we're going and if this is indeed what we want when we're thinking about AI and learning. And secondly, we need to build foundational skills and knowledge or AI literacy of teachers and students that will best position them to harness the potential of AI and to adapt to future innovations. And I'll talk about these two points um, in a bit more detail. So firstly, to consider where we're going and if this is indeed what we want, I propose we need to pause and to create some time and space to consider some important questions. And these include things like, what skills and knowledges do we believe are vital to retain as human? And what are we willing to be automated? What, cha what changes are needed in schools and beyond to help students to navigate a future where human and machine intelligence seem to be ever more connected? Um, will the uses of AI likely widen or narrow existing educational divides and finally, we need to be asking questions about whether AI will indeed improve learning without compromising inclusion, equity, quality and safety for our children and young people. And if indeed that is possible with the current state of AI. Um, education is given its function to protect as well as facilitate learning has a special obligation to be finely attuned to the risks of AI. Um, and that includes the risks that we know and those that are perhaps coming into view. But I think too often we do ignore these risks. Already the uses of within, sorry, already the uses of AI in schools um, are wide ranging. As I said, they've been used in schools for quite some time. And this is even though we do, haven't really adequately considered the risks or impacts on learning. So things that are being currently used include things like student-oriented systems, um, such as adaptive or personalised learning, um, writing supports that use AI tools, 
And then there are also a number of sort of teacher oriented AI systems currently being used. So adaptive assessment systems that respond to individual learning, diagnostic tools, and increasingly analysis tools that generate insights um, and analyze trends across school sectors and student achievement. And these have been used for some time. And I think the potential problem associated with the intersect of these tools and student learning is that the AI is essentially a black box um, if teachers and schools are even aware of its presence within these tools. So what we're seeing is um, limited teacher understanding of the way that the AI is informing these decisions or creating the decisions. And there's a lack of agency or control over the decision making on behalf of schools and teachers. Now, education is a huge market for ed tech products and they sell all sorts of solutions to schools. And as platforms and products are marketed to schools, claims about the effectiveness of particular AI products are, have been largely accepted without scrutiny. And these technologies need to be carefully researched, monitored and guided to maximize educational benefit and minimize risks. So how do we support education departments, schools and teachers to make informed decisions about AI um, within schools? And how do we support teachers to teach with and about AI in the classroom? It's more complex than just an online self-paced course on generative AI or um, just giving time to experiment with using AI. But we need a focused attention to give schools and teachers the time and resources to develop the skills and knowledge. Now, I've heard people claim that perhaps teachers aren't well positioned to teach about the complexity of AI systems, but teachers' expertise lies in their capability to explain complex or abstract ideas to students. It is by definition their job. So with adequate training and support, schools and educators are well placed to rise to this challenge. I think that there's a bit of a risk to repeat our errors of the past. So as technologies have become intuitive to use, um, we risk assuming that students are knowledgeable um, with how to use them and we fail to adequately support the development of their digital literacy. And this has been demonstrated in the research. We've seen persistent patterns of students' digital literacy levels showing little or much slower growth um, in comparison to significant growth in use and access to technologies. And this intuitive design that we see through automated decision-making and AI removes the need to understand the system to be able to use it. And this places us in a potentially poten a problematic position where um, we're more likely to use it in AI in inefficient or ineffective ways or to be harmed through our use um, and potentially perpetuate or amplify digital inequalities. So it's crucial that the first steps within education settings is to build a strong foundation of knowledge of AI systems and algorithms. And it's not just through use, but through understanding that we are better positioned to harness the potential of AI to push back on um, practices that we define as perhaps undesirable or not needed, and to be able to better adapt to the speed of the development of AI in the near future. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks so much, Carly. And uh, so now I'll hand over to Martin. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Carly, as well, for your brilliant overview. <laughs> I think it resonates a lot with what, what I was going to say. So I'll probably start echoing some of the thoughts here. But I think that only points out sort of the state of where we are. So uh, my name is Martin Laat, indeed. I'm, I'm uh, the co-director of the Centre for Changing Complexity in Learning in South West Australia, as uh, Michael already mentioned. And my personal research is interest is within network learning and, and understanding how uh, people connect and create and build knowledge together. And of course, now with the upcoming AI tools and applications in education, this now also extends to understanding human and non-human intelligence within connected learning. And I think it's a whole research roadmap ahead of us to really try and understand how that is uh, taking place, what, what kind of impact that may have on, on the learning experience, learning outcome, as well as on, on social learning designs and the way we are creative and solve complex problems. And in the context of, of or in the background of this, this context, um, leading now the development of a cooperative research bid uh, in Australia. 
And the reason for that is that uh, Kari was already saying it's like since November last year with the introduction of, of ChatGPT, basically there has been a serious hype and discussion across the media, but also within education about, oh, what does AI mean? What, what do we do with AI? Well, how will it impact our education and how will it change our education systems? And the interesting thing is, is that before, so to speak, uh, the end of last year, we were trying to set up projects in schools around the, the uptake of AI. And we needed to do a lot of explanations, sort of like why AI, what is AI, is it really important? Why is it coming? And all of a sudden, sort of like at the beginning of, of, of the new year, so to speak, there has been a tremendous interest. And I think that's, that's very positive. I mean, the interest has, of course, been both positive and negative. There's a lot of fear and excitement at the same time about AI. And that's, of course, uh, very re reasonable and, and natural to expect. But it, it sort of brings out that conversation about, OK, what is actually happening to education and, and how is it fundamentally changing with the introduction of AI into classrooms and into these education systems? So in order to start tackling this this big questions of national interest, so to speak. We, we are therefore leading the development of this cooperative center, which we call AI for Life. And the idea behind it is, is to focus on a center that will help empower citizens for a life with AI. And it's about uh, uh, adopting and developing uh, AI tools and solutions for training and education. And the, the, the idea behind the CRC is, is that it, it, it provides a, a, a center or, or kind of an ecology where different stakeholders can come together and, and start working on researching and developing AI tools and solutions for the education sector. So we are working with industry, uh, ed tech industry, ed tech developers, as well as the education sector. They're, they're uh, part of the partnership and, and uh, governance. So education departments and, and large education systems are uh, interested in, in joining the bids to start bringing sort of like this whole ecology together. And, and like uh, Carly already mentioned, like the national framework of AI will be one of these guiding principles to start working on a broader acceptance and understanding of AI within uh, education. And uh, the last couple of months, we spent a lot of time and research spending on sort of talking to potential partners and stakeholders about what is the need for such a center and, and how will it impact uh, the development of AI or the integration or the better understanding of AI in education, particularly in Australia. And some of the points that I will now reiterate as mentioned by Carly as well, but there is a great need for a for a bigger and better understanding of AI, but also translate that into a harmonized AI framework, basically. And within the context of a CAC, which have a lifespan of five to 10 years, you can actually start working on, on, on creating those kind of frameworks, but also fully research and test them out in, in, together in collaboration with schools, with teachers, and uh, the ed tech industry, basically. But as we see at the moment, it's a bit of a wild west out there. You know, there's a lot of AI technologies rapidly being developed. Chatbots are popping up everywhere. <laughs> so the large language modeling uh, applications are really being utilized. But, you know, there is still a lot of overpromise, a lack of understanding. And also, of course, the, how trustful are all of these tools? And therefore, uh, besides creating a more like a harmonized AI framework or foundational approach to what does it mean? What, how can we actually integrate these kind of things? But also, what does it mean if we have tools that are being deployed across uh, the span of the sector? So uh, a lot of tools are just sort of aimed at, at, at being used at school level. But what does it mean for a student if you start moving from one school to another? You know, uh, how, how do these systems and the data that's being collected basically uh, traverse along with you and, and starts to support uh, learning across the lifespan, basically. So the integration of AI is not just focused on, on a particular school or subject matter or, you know, at a micro level, we need to start thinking about what is the infrastructure in which AI is operating and how does it traverse across these uh, levels and uh, how does it impact learning and teaching across time. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work still that needs to happen. And there's a lot of work around sort of the integration and if you like, uh, the collaboration of several AI tools to start working together in that bigger ecology. 
Another point is, is of course, creating a evidence base. I think Carly mentions it, like a foundational understanding of AI. But like I said, the uh, the edtech tends to have a lot of over promise. You know, the new tools will will be a solution to everything. If you like, it will in, in, increase learning outcomes and stuff like that. But you know, against what background and how inclusive, if you like, are those tools? Uh, and, and and what is the bias, if you like, within those tools, if you start talking about algorithms and algorithm development? So there is a lot of research uh, in general and also very detailed in, in, in sort of specific areas that is required to start understanding the, the real potential impact of AI tools and services within education. And that comes, of course, then also with bigger transparency and openness about sort of the ways these tools work and operate and how decisions are being made. And in the context of the CEC, we think this is really important because that, that kind of research will then, you know, inform trials together with schools, but also about informing schools how to assess particular AI tools and, and inform procurement processes basically, and, and therefore align with the, uh, the more sort of standardized frameworks, it will give a better context of information upon which schools and education sectors can start making decisions about particular usage or uptake of AI, but also what to expect and how will this actually start to, you know, change how we design learning, how we teach and how we engage learning in particular learning processes. Another key component is governance and regulation. So uh, again, sort of what, what kind of, um, uh, boundaries do we need to put around uh, all of this AI? The South Australia was, uh, I think, the only state in Australia to, from the beginning since this year, to adopt AI and integrate AI in education. They did not put a ban on it. I think the other states are now sort of turning around and sort of seeing, yeah, we need to embrace this new development. And the question is, of course, how? And and in terms of upskilling. Uh, it, it's it, it's important, of course, to provide training and, and professional development to teachers, but also to to school leaders and 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 uh, you know policy makers and, and and a whole range of I, I, guess I would say jobs and, and roles within education needs to start to engage with understanding the potential impact of AI uh, in education. And finally, I think an, another important point is, is that part of the CRC is to bring that conversation together across the stakeholders to really start developing meaningful AI tools. So tools that address the needs of teachers and educators in the sector, rather than have this massive technology push. Uh, we like to open up that dialogue and start creating, you know, building and researching particular tools together in order to start having a powerful response to uh, the uptake of AI in education. There are a few other points I'd like to mention, but I'm not quite sure if there's time for that, but I think we should also not only just focus on, on of course, the, the, the impact on, on education in terms of how we teach and learn, but these tools will also impact how we conduct educational research. You know, what, what is the potential for AI tools to, to facilitate, if you like, data analysis, auto coding of, of, of data and, 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 you know, practices like that. So I think there's a lot of talk and, and research that is needed in order to see how AI might be able to assist or improve our research methodology, and even find fundamentally change how we conduct our research. And a similar impact it will have on, on uh, the theories of learning that we, uh, that we apply as a, as a theoretical framework to understand, you know, and, and research uh, learning processes. Uh, and I think the adoption of AI will start to create a rich dialogue in, in the def further development of those theories, or e at least, you know, they, they will put a, a strong reflection on, on that notion. Yeah. So maybe we can explore that a little bit more during the, the panel as well, but I yeah. <laughs> just want to yeah. raise it up. So yeah. No, th thanks. Thanks so much, Martin. That that's uh, really really fantastic. Another really fantastic overview. And um, we wanted to, you know, Martin mentioned um, algorithms within um, his overview as well. And we really did want to kind of broaden this conversation out to be about not just about AI as such, but about algorithms and algorithmic literacy, because obviously there's a close association between the two. But to some extent, um, in certain kinds of ways, different sorts of 
thinking or different sorts of literacies as well. And so, um, so Louisa is a um, an expert in in uh, in relation to algorithmic literacy. So I'll just uh, hand over to Louisa now to to give her overview. Thank you so much. Um... So yes, I'm I'm at the tail end of my PhD uh, submitting next week, and what I wanted to speak about today was sort of what led me to the PhD that I was doing, uh, which is I I studied the kind of how platforms curate content through algorithmic recommendation, and this is important because platforms like the likes of Facebook or Twitter or YouTube etc. have historically presented themselves as kind of neutral hosts of information or content um, and for reasons I'll explain further later I think that's a relevant point to bear in mind when we talk about generative AI etc but they're constantly ordering information and curating content in very like political and consequential ways so for instance for Google search um, it was only during my PhD that I you know discovered they have a quality uh, search evaluation guidelines, 175 pages long, uh, where they explain how they determine quality in the ranking of search results um, and, and like quite, quite political uh, contestable decisions of how they make those, those sorts of judgment calls. And it was striking to me that, you know, I had done two degrees before my PhD and I never thought about the way that Google really orders content aside from a very basic kind of uh, uh, understanding that it's supposed to be something to do with quality, but I mean, quality is a very open-ended contested, you know, term. And so I think in part for me, one of the really valuable parts of education is that I think this is like the stuff education is made for teaching you to think critically about the consequences of these like ordering systems that look very they sort of fade into the background you know you don't you don't really think about them you just get a list and you sort of and we know from research that people go to the first uh, page of google search results they don't question they don't you know they don't critique their their short on time and i think in this context of information overload which is only going to get worse with generative ai this ordering function is is critical so i i think that that's I, I guess the first thing that i wanted to raise and just to give a few examples from my research um i did some work with my colleagues at qt digital media research center looking at youtube's algorithmic recommender systems and when covid broke out youtube uh, made a commitment a claim to make uh, to be committing to raising authoritative sources in its search and recommendation results and then the question is, what is an authoritative source, right? Because it also included news media organizations which were sharing misinformative claims. But the, the sort of quick uh, way to operationalize authoritativeness in a computer science like sense at scale was to say news media, mainstream news media. Um, when we looked at feminism as a search term, YouTube did didn't have any policies around it. So we've got all sorts of problematic anti-feminist content being raised to the very top. So there are kind of like decisions made about where we curate more heavily and intervene uh, for so-called quality purposes and where we don't. Um, and I think that's sort of something to, to reflect on um, also for educators in terms of teaching literacy or discernment it's not just is this correct or or incorrect but it's sort of what by what processes do we decide what is an authoritative source um, which voices should get heard and which shouldn't um who should decide those sorts of questions um and and especially now that we know that a lot of you know large companies with commercial interests are making those decisions so i think that's that's an important point. And I think I just wanted to, um, I'm quite happy to, I'll keep mine short, um, short so that, like, of course, I, I have more things to say later. But I, I think what I did want to say was that um, I just want to highlight kind of what I think is what it's fair and reasonable to expect of educators and digital literacy. There's a lot, I think, here yeah, that depends on really good policy to make these systems safe before we talk about digital literacy, et cetera. So I think when if you're talking about a real like deterioration of the information environment, which I think is a very real risk with generative AI, et cetera, we're talking about a flood of information with no sense of what is accurate or not, deep fakes, which 
we don't even have the right tools sometimes to to identify them, let alone as an individual looking at them, this and that. I think it's we need to be honest and fair to educators that a lot has to happen sort of before things are unleashed. Um, you know, and, and there's, there's only so much that digital literacy and, and critical thinking can do in this kind of environment. Right, great. Thank you so much, Louisa. Now, um, so I'm just going to turn now to um, asking some questions of our panellists, um, but uh, shortly we'll turn over also to um, to Q&A from, from the rest of, of the audience. So please uh, think about questions that you might have and, and get them ready to ask. And uh, we can use the chat, but also uh if you uh, yeah if you uh, we'll probably try to ask you to um come on the camera and ask those questions as well um unless you specifically request to keep those in the chat and then I can read them out for you um so look the first um question I wanted to ask and I did have a question about hype but I think we've to some extent I think we've addressed that question about hype you know there there you know for the past 12 months there obviously has been an incredible amount of of hype and an incredible amount of focus on um, generative AI. Um, and I think, um, you know, Carly and Martin to an extent really have already kind of covered off on that. And I, I think, you know, we 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 are beyond hype in, in the sense that I think that we, we do know that there are going to be very real consequences um, and that, you know, generative AI will have really quite significant um, impacts on what happens in schools um, into the future. And so this isn't just another hype cycle, to put it that way. You know, this this is something that's going to, to stay with us and that we will be dealing with now into the future. But um, so I wanted to go this to this question of, um, you know, if you could choose just one thing or one idea that all children should learn about AI and or algorithms, what would that one thing be? And I think I, I want to ask this question because I think often... Um, you know, when we start to kind of deal with the, the, you know, the whole plethora, the whole monolithic thing that is technology in the first place, but then coming down to something like generative AI or AI more broadly can get very, you know, overwhelming. So, you know, what would be your advice for one thing that we really should be um, asking, what we should really be focusing on for all children to learn about? And, um, Carly, I might come to you first. Thanks, Michael. I think this is quite a tricky question that you've posed here, just one thing. So I'm going to be cheeky and, and sort of say something, my one thing will be quite general <laughs> that might capture a lot of different things. Um, I think if, if there was one thing that I think children should learn about AI and algorithms, I think is the importance of demystifying what AI is. So I think there's a tendency for sometimes for AI to seem like magic. Um, and in fact, we've seen tools like Canva actually call the embedded AI magic, the magic tool, um, which doesn't help the case. Um, so I think through sort of having at least a basic understanding of how it functions, how algorithms function, as Louisa said, can really help to sort of demystify what it is to um, sort of pull the curtains back um, and to see, to realise that our current forms of AI require human intelligence to create them and to dictate what the bounds are and how they function. And I think through understanding that, we can start to see um, the potential risks but also to learn how we can harness it. Um, and I think that as with that knowledge also, and this is maybe a bit too complex for children, but working towards it is that the, the current state of AI that we're working with is someone's imagined future for us. So it hasn't happened by chance. And we have this talk about AI being inevitable, but it is a small or a small group of people's imagined future for us. And if we realize that that is being created by humans, then perhaps we can start to imagine an alternate and more preferred future with AI where it's not just a few that maybe benefit, but maybe more of us can benefit from it. 
Right. Yeah, I think I think that's really important. I think that, you know, in a sense, that's kind of taking that broader sort of media literacy or critical literacy kind of perspective to stand back and say, well, what is this thing anyway? And, you know, it is a construction. It is it is made by humans and humans get to determine, you know, um, what will happen with this thing into the future. And we're allowed to question this and, and not just accept that it's inevitable that this will go a certain way. Uh, Martin, uh, what what would be your one thing? Yeah, I agree with everything that has been said so far, of course, but uh, I would like to perhaps try and take it a little bit further into the future because um, the current understanding is, of course, also based on the current hype. And uh, when we did a, a small study, it, it was very clear that kids understanding and kids trust of ai is just driven by the big tech company so if it's from google or apple then we trust it <laughs> if we may not know the source or if it's a little more dubious or whatever they might start you know asking a bit more critical questions around it but uh, i think louisa louisa also mentioned it is we, we we're almost at a state that we don't know anymore what's real and what's not real so I agree with all the the the, the notions, of course, of, of, of the, the ability to critically assess AI. But I, I would like to go one step further, if we can, and we will get there at some point. And it, it's it's what I think would be crucial is that children learn how they can create or develop AI to solve their own complex problems, so that that AI becomes a tool in your toolbox, if you like, that you can use for your learning, for your creativity, but in a way that you control how that's being done. And I think that's that's a different perspective because a lot of AI at the moment, it's we can just play with it, but it's given with its boundaries, you know? So it, it, you can only do with it what you can to some extent, but I'd like, I'd like to overcome that and that, that you can start to develop and create your own AI to help solve you with your your quest in life, so to speak. Mm. Can, can I ask Martin how um, how you might see that as so? So, what's probably going to happen first, right? Um, you know, the the kind of widespread application or, or use of AI, mm. generative AI in schools might be, for instance, through um, through Microsoft's Copilot, for instance. And so, mm. I can imagine teachers getting quite excited about the inbuilt AI tools within um, Word and PowerPoint and, you know, Im image generation software and so on. And, um, and, and many people will think, well, that is students, you know, using AI for their own purposes and taking control of AI to some extent. But I get the impression that you're talking about something more than that, that, um, that there's, yeah. there's a more fundamental creativity. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Well, uh, at the moment uh, I'm, I'm, running a project together with Intel and MeltCX. It's called the AI Playground. And in the AI Playground, uh, we offer learning challenges where kids can overcome these challenges with, with the use of AI. And, and, and within that context, uh, we very much want to push the envelope. So one of the challenges that we have at the moment is, is that the kids are sort of on a quest to explore life on Mars. And in order to get to Mars, they need to build this Mars rover, which is built from Lego. So we use computer vision in the classroom where the kids can use the AI to uh, understand how to build uh, the, the, the rover. And uh, so the AI can detect Lego bricks and can inform the kids about what these bricks uh, are for. Uh, they can select particular components that they're building on and then the AI can map Lego bricks that are on the desk uh, into that 3D model. So you can start to identify, okay, if I'm building this model, where are these bu uh, building blocks or these bricks positioned? And so in order to collaborate with the AI, they are capable of, of solving that problem. But where we want to go to is that kids can then start to design their own version of a Mars rover, basically and then start to interact with the AI in terms of, okay, how to build this, 
how can that be done? And therefore, then they're starting to develop AI to learn about different kinds of Mars rovers, basically, and therefore the AI capability through the, the training and the development of data that the kids provide, the AI capability becomes a lot broader and stronger, basically. Now, those are still sort of, you know, very... Uh, in, in sort of testing space. But I think these are kind of ideas of bringing AI experiences into the classroom where the conversation is more about how does AI work? How can we train and further develop AI in order to, to solve problems that we are confronted with rather than utilizing the AI tools to uh, in some way just be corrected, <laughs> if you know what I mean, huh? the, the spellings checkers uh, of the world today, basically. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, um, so, so we'll go to you, Louisa, about your your one thing, uh, and then looking at the time, I think we might almost be needing to move to to general Q and A. So, um, Louisa, um, yeah, yeah, I'm building off of the the two, but I'll I'll I have sort of two small, very connected points though. Um, one is that I think this point of sort of playing with the systems. I think even myself as a as a research, I'm a humanities researcher. Uh, AI and algorithms was not what I expected myself to be studying a few years ago. And it was because of the type of training I got, which made me feel like it was totally for me. It wasn't something I needed to be like bewildered by. Um, and that we played with the system, you know, we scraped the data, we looked at it, we thought about it, we read the policies. And I think there's scope to do this sort of stuff in, in classes. Um, and then the second thing I would say, which I think um, ties onto an earlier point is, that I'd want them to really learn about the material like costs and process behind AI. So I think partly like who are the people behind, on whose data is it being trained? Are they being compensated? Are they even being given the option to opt out? Um, and then the environmental cost, I think, I, I looked up a scary thing just to have it here, but it was that for every 20 to 50 questions you ask Chad GPT, it uses a small bottle of water. And I mean, like we're living through a crisis and I think our younger generations are really much better than us at like caring about the environment and thinking about it. And so I think like, as you're saying, AI isn't magic and it has very real costs. And so I think like having a much uh, education that talks about that is important. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, um, yeah, we absolutely haven't explored enough the kind of critical connection between technology use and the ramping up of, of of massive amounts of data and how that relates to sustainability and environmental cost for sure. Um, okay, so look, I, I do want to, I had a couple of other questions that I was going to ask the panel, but um, some of them have already been touched on in certain ways as part of our discussion anyway. And I really do want to provide the audience with an opportunity to, to ask some questions. So um, now there's a question in the chat from Akinori um, Akinori, did you want to come onto camera and and ask your question? And uh, you're muted at the moment. Hello. Good evening. Oh, good morning. <laughs> I think we are in the same time zone. Uh, yes, this is a, a little bit maybe off the topic, but uh, I'm uh, interested in AI powered conversation and the AI powered connection. Uh, connecting the people with the same interest and uh, maybe uh, with the guard rage the conversation among the people maybe in different location and maybe even in different uh, language so I I'm sure from the conversation we had it's a little bit off the topic but uh, if uh, you see any potential of using AI to get people connected and looking for the same um, say uh, same goals and uh, together uh, with the, the empowered discussion people will tackle with the uh, project-based learning uh, style about the topics then that can be also tied to the uh, curriculum maybe loosely coupled with uh, um, the the current the standard curriculum because now now the, you, you have this rigid curriculum then you it may not be allowing people to go a little bit outside of the curriculum. So this is my question. I, I, I hope this is still relevant to uh, the audience and the you. So so Carly, um, I'm going to turn to you for, for to answer this question, just in terms of, I think, uh, I think this is in some respects a broader question about 
you know, the use of of how we use technologies in the classroom to to do collaborative learning and to bring people together and to to solve problems together, sometimes at a distance. And I guess we saw a lot of this during COVID, for instance, when everyone had to learn online um, and so on. Do you have any um, thoughts um, in response to that question? Mm, so I, I'm going to respond, but I've, please correct me if I've misinterpreted the question because I wasn't 100% sure. Um, so I do think that there is a lot of potential to further explore the ways that we can use technology to collaborate outside of our immediate networks. Um, Akinori mentioned something about a, sort of quite a, a controlled curriculum, um, but I do know in the Australian context, our curriculum does facilitate such connections and there's an increasingly um, global focus um, with general capabilities about connecting with our, our Asian neighbours um, and making those meaningful connections and collaborations through learning. Um, so I do think that there is definitely potential to, to further explore those options and, and how AI might be able to assist um, through making those connections meaningful. Yeah, Martin. Yeah, maybe did... just to... Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was just trying to chip in. Uh, an, an example of, 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 of this, it, it's a bit more in the higher education context, but a, a colleague of ours in our research centre, he is developing, together with a PhD student, uh, studies around the use of virtual reality and uh, in, in the context of language learning and language training. And part of the idea is that... Um, this is in particular students from Asia that are looking to study in Australia. They uh, potentially have a few sort of language barriers uh, when they come into Australia, and that might be related to mastering, if you like, uh, the language that is uh, discipline specific. So if you're training in the STEM area or if you want to become an engineer, you might not be that fluent in the language that is being used in, in the in the resources and materials that are being taught in the classroom. And, and through the augmented and, and virtual realities tools that are developing, they want to start, even before the students come to Australia, they want to open up uh, the dialogue already through these virtual reality systems and, and, and position them, if you like, already in that space where they can also meet one another. And, and so it's, it's, it's also about social and connected learning. And through that, they they come on Australia already with a stronger sort of set of social relationships. So that's one thing. But they also have been more exposed with the language that's being used in the educational and discipline uh, context. So I think these, these could be some ways of starting to think about the role AI can play. Because through AI, you can also start to then train more specific chatbots where uh, people in those uh, environments can start to interact with and feel more prepared uh, and they can just continue to support that sort of important language learning to overcome particular barriers or, or, or uh, dispositions, if you like, uh, while tra traveling to Australia or preparing to live in Australia, but also while you're in Australia itself. Yeah, thank you. And, and Louisa, um... You know, some of your work has absolutely focused on kind of how algorithms reinforce polarization, right? And and kind of um, um, and, and hate speech and so on. Um, I mean, not necessarily related to AI, but but just in relation to algorithms more generally. Have you seen, I guess, good examples of where um, there may be instances on on social media platforms where? Um, where polarization is being challenged or, or, or nuanced? So I think um, I could give myself one of in one of my um, PhD case studies was the Amazon bookstore. And for I'm sure many of you have used Amazon and kind of when you go on an, a product, there's a few different recommendation panels usually underneath um, and titles like um, customers who bought this also bought, customers who viewed this also viewed, related to this item. So although we can't peek behind, you know, the code that 
Amazon users, we get the sense that they are optimizing for different things in those cases, you know, connecting you based on different patterns of behavior. And what emerged from that was that the sort of the content you saw um, changed quite a lot depending on whether they were basing the association between people on similar purchasing patterns or based on the item itself. So I guess that's just to say that I think like at least in our commercial digital platform environment, algorithms that their main aim is that they connect people either to other people or to content. Um, sometimes other people are the content on some of the platforms. So it's, um, and, and I think there's good and bad ways of how that can be done. But I guess what I want, what I would want to say is that it's quite difficult to get it right. So like, there's a lot of criticism and I think it's justified and I'm not sort of going to, but, but I think when you sit down and think, how would we want these systems to connect people? Um, it raises actually a whole set of like quite challenging, um, value questions like why you want why would you think these people are associated is it just because of their behavior should you try to expose people to different types of people than they would otherwise be exposed to etc but the second quick thing i wanted to say on language is just that there's some really interesting research by the center for democracy and technology on the way that large language models currently are really failing like a lot of languages globally um and I, so i you know i come from malta and maltese is a low resource language for example because it's not used a lot and there's not a lot of data online so the extent to which they can power these systems with those languages is limited um and so i i think like we also need to be really careful of which gaps you know we're we're just reinforcing through these these systems and that's yeah right thanks so much louisa um so we don't have any more questions in the chat at the moment but please um Please kind of raise your hand if you if you would like to to ask a question, or uh, or just let us know in the chat that you would like to ask a question. Otherwise, I will I will just go on to my next question. But um, is there anyone who would um, would like to ask another question? Not at the moment. Okay. So um, I am. Uh, my next question is about. Um, how challenging this is going to be for teachers and educators in the classroom, whether this is, um, you know, in, in primary schools or secondary schools or, or right through to tertiary education. I think that we we all kind of recognise to some extent that um, teachers and educators are going to have to develop new uh, knowledges and skills to be able to effectively use um, AI and to, and to teach about algorithms in the classroom. So I just wanted to ask where you currently, where you think um, we currently stand in relation to this journey of helping educators to understand the relevance of AI and algorithms to education. And, um, and maybe I'll turn to you again first, Carly, if that's okay. Not a problem. <laughs> um, so I, before I answer that question, I think it's really important to echo the point that Louisa made um, earlier in our session about the importance of regulation right. um, as a, a precursor to thinking about how we use AI in schools. And I think I completely agree. It is so important. Um, unfortunately, the skeptic in me sort of moves beyond that because we know that regulation is slow and it, and it usually um, sort of fails to keep up. So the reality is that it's our schools and teachers and students who are needing to be on the front foot to adapt and to, to um, address the challenges that we're seeing in schools at the moment. Um, and I think it was mentioned before that there is a lot of fear, but there's also a lot of excitement. Um, I had the privilege of presenting at an AI for Education conference in May this year, and I was absolutely gobsmacked at how many teachers were present, and they were so incredibly passionate and excited um, about the, the prospect of, of teaching with and about AI um, in schools. So I think that it is a great challenge. I think there's definitely lots of teachers out there who are poised and ready to take this on. Um, but I do think that collectively we need more time and space and resources 
to better support teachers to be able to um, think about maybe some points that haven't been focused on as much. So in our rush to sort of jump in and start to try things and not want to be left behind, I'll be overlooking the risks and the ethical implications that perhaps are associated um, with using AI, particularly with young children. Um, yeah, so I think there's still a lot more support that is, is needed, but I think that teachers and schools are so well positioned to take on this challenge if supported in the right way. Right. I just want, I, I mean, I want to riff off off that a little bit and maybe come to you, Martin, um, and, and, and Carly, you know, feel free to jump back in as well, of course. But um, so in relation to regulation, where do you think that regulation needs to come from then? So um, one of the challenges, of course, for, for regulation is that we're talking about uh, you know, international companies that cross cross national boundaries and regulation at a governmental level um, is usually nationally based. And, you know, so that may, what, what ends up happening, it seems to me, is that it's, it's regulation that is either originating in the United States or maybe perhaps in the European Union that has the most impact because um, those are very big markets for uh, technology companies and they have to pay attention once once the US and, and and Europe kind of gets involved in relation to regulation. But um, yeah, I mean, what kind of regulation do we need to, to create the right kinds of guardrails to ensure that AI and algorithms are used in ethical and productive ways in, in education and in society more generally? Martin, um, you mentioned regulation earlier. Can you can you Yeah, talk I did. It's 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 a challenging area, and I think Carly already mentioned it. it, it, it the, the field is also so rapidly developing, so it's hard to keep pace with what's possible. So what AI can't do now, it might be able to do in a few weeks or months, or you know. So it's it's hard to predict, and and so some kind of regulation is is really important, and 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 within the context of the Australian governance, that there their big push is towards the, the development of secure, responsible and trusted AI. So I think those are a few hand handrails that we can start thinking about. Um, I, I guess the difficulty with it is, is that with, with this sort of distributed system in which we are all living and operating, it, 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 you almost need like a, a global regulative agreement on certain things, because if, it, oh. if the regulation is, is based in, the, in Europe, you know, uh, what's to say what's happening in, in countries beyond, uh, perhaps maybe in Russia or in China or in, uh, in Latin America. So it, it's really hard to understand sort of uh, what the regulations and regulatory needs are. I think it's interesting that that the industry, the tech industry themselves are arguing and asking for regulation and for the need of regulation. I think in, in a free market that is rather unseen <laughs> perhaps to some extent but it's quite interesting and, and i think that might be driven by a bit of fear that that maybe the ai the developing might become so strong that uh, it, it sort of is, is a little bit out of their own hands so to speak so maybe the regulation is there to keep a bit of a safety rail right. around all those things but when when we talk about regulation i think for educational purposes i think that thinking about the kind of regulation really needs to come from education so bringing voices together, like I was saying in, in the CSC AI for Life, for example, if we can start having meaningful conversations about what is the kind of AI that we want and need in our education systems and, yeah. and, and how is that supposed to perform, from there you can start building meaningful regulation around all of this. Yeah, right. Thank I you. Just jump back in because I think Martin mentioned a really important point earlier as well about procurement processes within an education department. Yeah as a right. way to try and regulate what's coming in. And I think the problem with procurement processes within education departments at the moment is they often um, involve the, the technology company to self-assess to some degree and to have quite a bit of an influence over what's happening there. Um, so there needs to be some added supports for education departments to be able to um, yeah. engage in rigorous procurement processes, which I, I don't think that there is enough support in that space at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, look, we're nearly at, um, at time. I think we've got about one minute left. And uh, forgive me, Mimi, but I'm going to just read this question out 
um, and just get a quick response from our guests. So Mimi Ito is asking um, if any of you have seen uh, policies at the school, district or government level that are focused on equity issues specifically um, because she fears that this we may end up with a, a rich gets richer kind of phenomenon um, so that, you know, advantaged schools will continue to be advantaged, for instance, and advantaged students will continue to be advantaged. So um, I haven't seen any specific kind of local policies like that. Have any of you seen things at that kind of level? I do know that one of the key reasons that we've seen the, the federal education minister step forward and say that he approves of the, the national framework is for fear that private schools are currently using generative AI and public schools largely have a ban and they see that potential. Um, and there is some items within those principles that vaguely address issues of equity, but there's there's no specifics on, on how that can be achieved. Right. Yeah, right. Well, look, thank you. I mean, we could keep talking all for the rest of the day about this topic, couldn't we? It's such a such a um, an important topic. It's obviously going to continue to have such um, relevance to how we move into the future with with education. I just really um, want to thank you, Ma uh, Carly, Martin, and Louisa for um, for joining us and uh, sharing your expertise today. Uh, Louisa, special shout out for being up at two. AM. And um, could you all please join me in thanking our plenary? Um, and of course, um, the Connected Learning Summit continues um, for a little while today and, and then of course tomorrow. So please join us for other sessions. And uh, thank you. Thank you from me. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure.